All right, if you have your Bibles with you, then we can turn to the book of James, James chapter 2, and we're just going to get one verse there to get our text, and then we'll, we'll move to other places in the Scripture as the Lord gives us time. Now, James is an epistle that a lot of people want to avoid because it addresses works time and time and time again. And in fact, uh, of the King James translators, there were some that didn't even think this needed to be here. But I think the thing about the, the uh, book of James, it gives us the results of salvation, and that's works. And without uh, salvation, there is no works, and without works, there's no proof of salvation. And I think that's why a lot of people don't like this book, but it is inspired by the Almighty, and it should be looked at time and time again. So with that said, James chapter 2, I want to read just verse 5 uh, for our text. Hearken, my beloved brethren, have not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for all your goodness and watch care. We thank you for leading our church to the sickness and the illness, Lord. We praise you for that. Lord, we thank you for each and every one that is here tonight, and we pray that you would help us to uh, support the church just in our presence, Lord, and that we would never be unfaithful to that. Uh, God, tonight we pray that you would bless your words to the hearts of the hearers, Lord, that you'd send the Holy Ghost this way that we might understand your word more. And we pray these things in the sweet and the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I want to draw your attention to this. And uh, James is writing. He says, hearken my beloved brethren. So he was talking to the redeemed. He was talking to the saved. Uh, male and female uh, converted people. When he says brethren, many times it includes... Uh, the word sisters is used in the King James Bible, but less and less frequently. But I believe he's talking to all the church. Therefore, uh, so he says, hearken, my beloved brethren, have God not chosen the poor of this world? And when he says that, certainly there is some truth about financial gain. And, and, you know, even our Lord Jesus in his personal ministry said it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to go to heaven. And uh, certainly worldly riches could be attached to that. But uh, I believe the, uh, the poor that he's talking about is what people would consider spiritually poor. Uh, lack of grandiose things. Now, they're really rich in the spirit, but the way the world looks at them, their buildings are plain, uh, their speakers are uneducated, uh, they're not what is appealing to the eye. And so those individuals, the Lord Jesus, uh, I mean, James says, that's the type that we're looking at. They're, uh, they're, he has chosen the poor of this world rich in faith. Now, if anything could be said, and, and what I see is it getting more and more difficult, I want to be rich in faith. Now, I've given up any, any whatsoever belief that I'll be rich in the things of this world. Uh, uh, not only I think that distracts from the ministry, but again, I've said this many times, God will give you what you can handle. And if, if He don't make you rich, Obviously, you weren't the candidate to be rich. Amen. Amen. And so we, uh, we accept that for what it is. But any true believer, not just Baptist, but all believers can be rich in faith. Mm -hmm. I believe that more and more as I get older. And I believe really what's crippled our churches is the lack of faith of the believers. Uh, most of the miracles that we look back we write off to apostolic work and the ministry of Christ. But you know, there was great miracles after all those people were dead. Sure. And, and the days of miracles have not passed, but the, the day of faith right bringing miracles is past. Now, God ain't going to do exactly what you asked to just because he asked 
just because you ask Him. But you know, I fully believe this. If it's the intent and plan of God, He can still raise the dead. If it is in the t intent and the will of God, I believe that, the, that we could still walk water. It is our faith that is the problem. Now, I'm never, I'll never say, because I know my stinking flesh for what it is, that I have the faith to walk the Cumberland River, but I certainly believe that uh, my hindrance is not the ability of God, it is my faith. Uh, and, and so because we understand and know that God doesn't change, so the miracles He wrought in His personal ministries and the days of the apostles is uh, a still obtainable thing. But even more than that, I just want to have richness in faith. Your, your richness in faith begins right here. That I believe every word cover to cover is the inspired holy word of God. And I'll go even further for English speaking people. It's this one right here. Yeah. And you know what? That's one thing my faith has brought me to. It's not much, but I believe it. I, I certainly believe that this is the uh, authorized word of God. And if it says it, I may not understand it, but I do know this, it's right. And, and, and that's where faith begins. And I don't, I don't know if we in the modern day realize how deprived of faith, how anemic of faith that the modern day believers are. Not just the Lord's churches, just individual believers themselves, me, my wife, uh, our friends, individually weak in faith. Uh, not, not any longer believing that God is able. That is being weak in faith, and I want to be rich in faith. Uh, rich in the uh, belief that He is able to do it. Now, if you will go with me to the Gospel of Luke, and if you have time this week and your time remaining and you don't already have uh, your study uh, lined out, uh, read the whole book of Luke because it's all about faith. And I've often wondered why the Gospel of Luke is so uh, rich in faith. Again, if you, if you have your Bibles, Luke 17, and we'll be there in a minute. And I think this, Luke was a physician. Mm -hmm. Luke was a very practical thinker. And I believe he had to really work on his faith. I believe the more practical we are and the more educated, and I put that in big quotation, uh, the more difficult faith becomes. You know, uh, uh, I don't know a lot and forgotten some of what I knew, but the working of this body is miraculous. But... Uh, and you almost begin to think that you can make it heal. That is impossibility. All this is put together by the Almighty, but knowing so much about the structure of the body and how it works even, and as miraculous as the body, I mean the heart is in the center of the body, it really is just a double pump. It does like this all the time. That's why you have love, dub, love, dub, love, dub. And... I don't know how much they understood about it in Luke's day, but when you see that all the time and know what that means, it's hard to think, you know, God made that. So I think Luke, the physician, because of his education, really worked on his faith. And we as the Lord's people, that's exactly what we need to do. It just work on our faith. Uh, uh, pray about it. Study about it. Build your faith. And you know, I believe if we do that, when God gives us a big task, such as Moses leading the children out of Egypt, that you believe you can do it. That, that, that you'll have the confidence in not yourself, but in the God of the Bible, that yes, it can be done. Gospel of Luke chapter 17. Let's begin reading in verse 5. <clears throat> uh, Gospel of Luke 17, beginning in verse 5. And the apostles said unto him, uh, said unto the Lord, increase our faith. Yeah. Now that's a very godly desire, is it not? Uh, you know, the apostles had lots of problems along the way, and, and, and they were often doubting the ability of the Lord, but he, uh, but he 
But they say increase our faith. Now, to increase your faith, number one, you have to see God work. It is a very, very difficult thing to have faith if you've never seen God work. And to see God work, very, very frequently He puts you in a hard spot. And when He puts you in the hard spot, it will increase your faith. Now, what we believe is that, it, you know, the only way to build faith is when things work out like we want them to to start with. Yeah. That ain't much faith. Faith is when it, you fall flat on your face and it's good enough anyway. That's increasing your faith. Uh, what confidence do you place in the Lord? You know, that, that's one problem with Armenian doctrine. We'll trust our soul with Him, but won't trust our life with Him. How stupid. But that, that, that is what that generates. And, and you know what? They lack faith. They really do. They, they, they missed it by about 18 inches. They have it up here, but they don't have it here. And, and so we find that these apostles approach the Lord Jesus. We want our faith increased. Now, I want you to see how he, uh, uh, how he uh, answers them. And the Lord said, if ye had, and I want you to underline that in your Bible, if. And I'm assuming that means because they did if ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto the sycamon tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. Now that's a miraculous event. And, and that's just only a smackerel of faith. So that, first of all, tells me that my faith is at least less than a mustard seed. And, and, and I understand, I think in uh, Matthew's Gospel, it's written sycamore tree. And I've also heard that it doesn't coincide with the sycamores that we have here in the hills of Tennessee. I, I, I wanted time to look it up, but didn't. But whatever kind of tree, can you imagine saying to one of these great oaks up here in this grove, go throw yourself in the Cumberland River? And it happened. Now, we're not there. In fact, we would feel pretty foolish looking at that oak and say, I want you in the river. Would we not? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know well enough that I wouldn't even go out there and do it. I, I, I may not be much, but I'm honest. And, uh, and, but could you imagine the realness of that happening? It has to be able, it has to be there, or it wouldn't be in the Word of God. So whatever my level of faith is tonight, I know it's less than a grain of mustard seed. If I could get a grain of mustard seed, I'd be doing good. And, and, and so we find that he begins about, he begins in teaching them about the faith to anticipate the impossible. You know, me and Donna was talking the other day, and uh, I, don't know, I don't like to be a Debbie Downer and, you know, all that goes with that. But you know what? The church is a little small right now, and some of our members are older. I'm past middle age now, and you know what? You look around and say, Lord, what are you going to do? Well, we need a mustard seed. Mm -hmm. That's what we need. Uh, and you know what? The Bible says this too. Who can know the mind of God? Mm. We can't. Uh, we can't. And, and so we find that what we need is to make an inventory of our faith and see where we're really at. Where is my level of faith? Now, a lot of people get down on Peter, but you know what? Peter had faith to step out of the boat, didn't he? And I would be daring to say that I wouldn't have done it. I don't know that I would even say, Lord, bid me unto thee. We need more faith. Mm -hmm. you, you know what? When you have full faith in Christ, it's the most pleasant life that you could ever live. Mm -hmm. No bumps in the road, nothing taking you by surprise because you know it's all of the goodness of God. That's faith. 
And when you when you have that you and you live that way, listen, nothing can take you by, by storm, nothing can take you by startle because you have faith. Verse 7. But which of you have a, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by when he's come from the field, go sit down to me. And will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup and gird thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Now notice he, he makes this servant, he makes this comparison. And, and first of all, let me say that we are the servants. A lot of times we forget that. And if Christ bids us here, we go that we go there. If he bids us over here, we go over here. And I have to come to this conclusion when we stop doing that, it hinders our faith. Yeah. It, it makes it even less than it already was. And, and, and so we find, he says, you have a servant out in the field, and you call, and he comes back, are you going to fix him a big meal? Now, we might be inclined to do so, but if you understood servitude, you would be the one to say, get in there and get me something to eat. Right. And, and, and so what the teaching is, it may be a long, long, long road. It may take a long, long time. So well, what was he saying to build your faith? First of all, be, be satisfied with being a servant and just hang in there. Now, uh, I, I've never done this. When, when um, uh, Mama used to talk about her, her mother... Uh, we called her nanny. There were seven of those children, and when their da their daddy died, she was eleven, and they had to take over the farm all together. And it was her job to cook for the other seven. And and she learned to cook very young and was a good cook. But could you imagine her doing all her job, and then her mother coming in and saying, "Now you hit the field." But that's what Christ asked of you. Yeah. Uh, our, our, our work is never done. And in that, it will build your faith. When you fall flat on your face in the ministry, get up. When you fall, fall flat on your face as a mother, get up. When you fall flat on your face as a pastor, get up. And I guarantee you, you'll learn something from it. So we find the first thing that faith comes by, it comes by hard work and depending on Christ. It comes with a timely thing, not just, not just instantaneously being filled with faith, but by work, apparently to this. Verse 9, doth he think that the servant, because he did these things that were commanded him, <laughs> I trow not, or I think not. So likewise ye, when ye have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Now think about that. You ever feel like you're just doing your duty? You're showing up. Uh, in the morning, Lord, Lord willing... I'll get up about 6, take a shower, hopefully hit the road at 7, be at work by 7.45. Is that how you're serving the Lord? Now, in exchange for me doing that every day, you know what I anticipate? My little bank account going, blink! You don't get a paycheck anymore. You, you, you wait for your, your blink on the screen. Is that what you're waiting for? It's just a blank. Because see, faith has nothing to do with that. And if we are just coming to see the blank, you're not going to grow your faith. If you're not coming because you love Christ and you know this is where He would have you to be, you're spinning your wheels. Faith comes. Faith is grown by... <laughs> <laughs> by being zealous to come. And so it cost them 
It calls for some really self-examination if our faith is present. And if it is present, is it growing at all? Uh, 1 Thessalonians. Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica. 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter number 3. 1 Thessalonians 3 in the first verse. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 3 in the first verse. The Bible says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, no longer could stand it, no more could calm ourselves, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent to Mothesis, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Jesus Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Now, um, Paul was a little concerned, and we'll talk about some afflictions that had came upon that group, that those afflictions was going to hinder the growth of their faith. And you know what? If we be real honest, it does. You know, when seemingly nothing is going well and everything is crumbling around you, it's hard for your faith to stand. Now, he was concerned about the Thessalonians, and we'll see in a minute why, because they were being physically abused for their belief, and he was afraid that their faith would be compromised, that their faith would be worn down because of the abuse. But we'll find and what it's been through all through history. You know what that really does? It grows faith. As long as you're... You know what Paul said, I think it was to the church of Corinth, second time around, comparing spiritual unto spiritual. We cannot compare strength by what's out there. We just cannot do it. Faith is here. Faith is here. And we need to realize and know, first of all, be honest with yourself and measure your faith. And secondly, don't compare it to what the world says faith is. And, and, and so we find that Paul writes to them and said, I want Timothy to check up on you. Um, verse 3, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. Now, when trouble comes and when difficulty arises, when discouragement comes across the screen, here we see that Paul didn't want them moved. He didn't want them to be to, and not their building being moved to a different location. He didn't want them to be moved spiritually. And what would prevent that? Faith. You know, I look over the last 25 years of ministry, and, and when I started out, there were a lot of good young men that loved the Lord apparently and was ready to serve them the rest of their lives. But now, what we believed then, I don't know any of them that's hanging on to it. I'd say the biggest one is modest dress among women. I remember when, and I could name some names I ain't going to, they might download me. Uh, but there was a lot of them one to die. We, we would travel all over this country and find people believing the exact same thing we do concerning life itself. And it's just about gone. Mm -hmm. So where does that leave us? Mm -hmm. Leave us in a good shape if we have faith. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, what does the Bible say about stuff like that? The end can't come unless there be a great falling away. Right. Where is your faith? What, what, what's, it, what's it doing? How, how strong is it? How's its growth been lately? Where is your faith? That no man should be moved by afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed there unto. And so they're coming. He's appointed them that way, and it will happen. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. He says, you're going to get both. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith. Now, what you want, I want you to see what it did, did, doesn't say. 
He didn't say, I sent you no the faith. The faith are the truths and the oracles handed down from Jesus Christ himself to the churches. But he says, I wanted to check on your faith. How much do you believe? Whom are you putting confidence in? What, what, how, much, how much faith are you putting in this? Yeah. That's what he wanted to check up on. Because he knew that things were getting trembly. He knew things were getting difficult. You know what? We need to do that sometime. Yeah. You know, I've often thought if the Lord inspired church letters today, what they might look like. What, what they might say to the church at Dover. And so he says, I couldn't stand it any longer. I had to know. I, had, I seemed to know your faith. Lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. So who is the stealer of our faith? Right here it says the tempter. Who's the tempter? The devil. The devil. So when our faith shrinks, and when you have precious little like mine, you sure don't need her to shrink. Or when your faith goes poof. Just remember it came from the devil. It, it came from Satan himself because that's what he loves to do. Verse 6. But now when Timotheus came from us, uh, came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith. What he, what he brought back was saying, you know what? <laughs> they're more, they're more uh, uh, depending on you. They have more faith on you. They have more faith on the work of Christ than, than they did when we left them. Man, that's a good report, ain't it? You know, as I age, I want it to be known to my children and grandchildren that I was a man of faith. But it ain't going to happen if they don't see it. I mean, I could preach it all day long, but is it blooming out on me uh, like, uh, like blooms on a peach tree? That's where they learn. You know what? People aren't going to listen to you much, but they will watch you. And so we need to, we need to have some kind of blooms of faith where people, uh, when, we, when we go through these trials, that we simply depend on Christ. That is what faith is about. Now, uh, go with me to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Paul, beginning his letter the second time around to the church at Thessalonica, he says, we are bound to thank God always for you. You know, have you ever thought about that? If uh, I ask you this, what about the other churches around here? Sometimes there's a little friction between them, and we'd be lying if we didn't say that that wasn't true. But right about the church at Julian, are you praying for them? Do you thank God for them? What about the church at Clarksville? See, uh, Paul was concerned enough, wasn't he? And he said, I rejoice at the report that I'm getting. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it, as it is meet or necessary, because your faith groweth exceedingly. So he found out their faith was good in 1 Thessalonians, and now he finds out that their faith is just in numerous, that it's, a, that, that it's growing exceedingly, that it's coming up everywhere. Now, uh, I know some of you have seen this, maybe all of you, but when I was a kid, mushrooms would pop up overnight. And it seemed like it would be always after a rain, and, and we'd wake up and... Uh, there was an old log behind the house, somebody that's where they are, and me and Judy would go out, and overnight there'd be about 25 of them, just poof. Man, that's growing exceedingly quick, is it not? Yeah. Just out of nowhere, and suddenly they're there. That's what he saw at Thessalonica. Now, how do you suppose he saw that? When people were sick, I believe they turned it over to God. When there was no money to be left, I believe they turned it over to the Lord. When there was no food in the cupboard, I believe he turned it over to God. And he saw that in them. 
Now, the exceeding great riches is this. Those prayers were answered out of nowhere. Mm. Out, of, out, out of just the goodness of God. Mm. And that will grow your faith. See, faith is not seeing your prayers answered. Faith is this, accepting the situation as it's been offered by God. Now, and not only accepting it, rejoicing in it. You're going to... Now, I hate to tell Adam and his family, I, I've had the second deal with COVID. I hope y'all don't. I pray that y'all don't. But if it comes knocking again, you're going to rejoice in that? I don't think you'll rejoice. I don't think any of us can rejoice. But I do think you did say this, God's able. Yeah. God's able. Mm -hmm. See, faith, faith has to be there. You ever wonder why the churches, I don't believe numerically, uh, churches are much different than they've ever been. But I will say this, today the churches lack faith. They, they lack the ability to give. They lack the ability to even give money to other people. You know, if you give money to an individual with a big question mark on it, you might as well keep it. There's no faith in it, none whatsoever. And so we see that, not only that, that their faith uh, even grew. Last place, Romans, the church at Rome, Romans chapter 14. Romans 14, read one verse for time's sake. Romans 14 and verse 22. Very simple question. Hast thou faith? I can't answer that for you, but you can answer it for yourself. Hast thou faith? And if you do have it, how much do you have? Before I leave this place, I'd love to have a grain of mustard seed. Wouldn't you? Just that much. To believe that God will do exactly as He's promised to do. I'd like to have that much, and, and I'll be the first one to tell you I don't. And I'd sure like to. Mountain be thou removed. Go yonder hence. And boom. No longer in your way. I believe I believe that quite literally. Me and a preacher brother had a discussion, we'll call it, about that thing. And he was saying, Well, that's just the problems in your life. And all I had to say to them was, him was, well, that ain't what the Bible says. Can you take care of your problems? Sure he can. Can you take uh, smoky mountains and make them a flat field? You bet it can. Hmm. We need faith, do we not? <laughs>